So good afternoon. Um, I want to welcome everyone to our webinar today entitled The She-Demon Killer of Pregnant Women and Infants, Preparent Amulets at the Crossroads of Culture with Professor of Islamic Art, Christian Gruber, and also faculty curator here at the Kelsey. In preparation for the new permanent gallery at the Kelsey Museum, um, featuring our Byzantine and Islamic collection of artifacts, we are showcasing smaller spotlight exhibitions. Christiane Gruber has curated a spotlight of artifacts entitled Crossroads of Culture, in which the themes of personal treasures, prayer and protection, and bread are highlighted. Today's webinar will focus on the iconography of a particular bronze amulet on display in the spotlight gallery. Welcome, Christiane. I want to throw it over to you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks so much, Stephanie, for having me here for a little uh, lunchtime informal chat. Um, what I'll do today is uh, take you into the Kelsey's uh, spotlight that I curated on um, an object that caught my attention. And that object made me go down a research rabbit hole. And I thought, why go down it by myself when I can uh, take everybody with me? So let me now share my screen um, so I can reconstitute uh, that exercise uh, for everybody. So Stephanie, how does that look on your end? It looks great. Thank okay. you. You can see everything. Great. All right. So um, as Stephanie mentioned, the Kelsey Museum is now preparing for a, a permanent installation of what had been called Byzantine and Islamic art, but it's gonna be much broader than, than that. Uh, we've just renamed the gallery. It will be Crossroads of Culture and the time bracket will be essentially late antique to early modern, late early modern, so 400 to 1800. Uh, we've been experimenting with some themes and objects inside the museum with these small spotlight exhibitions. And I was uh, lucky to be able to experiment with the second spotlight. As uh, Stephanie mentioned, we had a couple themes. Uh, one of them was uh, bread, uh, bread as the symbol and sustainer of life. Um, we had also a vitrine on prayer and protection. So that included a Quran and some amulets and another case that highlighted personal treasures, um, including necklaces, toys, whatever you hold dear to, to yourself. And so we're conceptualizing themes and objects, how these might work in the permanent uh, display. While I was working with the prayer and protection case, one object caught my attention, and it's a, a very large, quite substantial uh, bronze amulet that, that was cast and it has a hole in the top which suggests that it was intended for suspension on a wall, on a person, on an object, it's unclear. Um, and that um, bronze amulet, um, which was intended for suspension, includes a depiction of a rider on a horse or a mount um, that rider is haloed, has a spear, is accompanied by an angel, and uh, he most likely is spearing a creature down below. Um, it's believed that this amulet, and there are many like it, uh, dates from about the 6th century uh, of our era and comes from what is now Syria, Palestine, so the Eastern Mediterranean of uh, the Byzantine period. Uh, as an Islamicist, I was fascinated because this is the eve of the advent of Islam in the Eastern Mediterranean. The 600s sees uh, basically a, a confrontation between Byzantium and Islam. So I thought, huh, I wonder if there are items like this in the corpus that I, with which I'm not familiar. And what is this object? Um, uh, thanks to Carlo Berardi and my colleagues, Byzantinists, we were able to uh, decipher more uh, of, of from this amulet. The inscriptions here were read uh, by Carlo. The inscription right next to the writer uh, reads, uh, one God who conquers evil, uh, right here. And then all around the rim is another inscription, a psalm. Uh, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the care of of the God of heaven. Then we realized that the writer 
could be either Solomon or Saint Sicinius of Antioch uh, or Antakya, which is in Eastern Turkey, Syria today. Um, and both Solomon and Saint Sicinius are believed to have been able to vanquish this uh, demon who is a female, a she demon, uh, who has many different names, but in, in Byzantium, she's referred to as Gelo or Gula, um, and she's believed to kill women at night, uh, especially when they're having children, and she's considered to be the demoness or demoness uh, that uh, destroys fetuses um, and newborns. And uh, she's often represented as a hybrid animal, uh, and in the case of this particular medallion, as either a woman with sagging breasts, and this is a common feature, a long craggedy hair, or a half animal, half human entity. So when I looked at this uh, uh, gelo, um, which sounds a lot like hul in Arabic or ghoul, right, a succubus, I asked myself, well, what is this creature? Where is she coming from? And then where does she go after Byzantium? And is there anything that we can do with this motif uh, in the permanent gallery? And what might that look like? And that's what got me started on um, this research trajectory that at first I didn't understand would take me into a 4,000 year old history of women who are having children, so puerperant women, um, and children being at the height of vulnerability and how to combat uh, either maternal mortality or child mortality, which is a common thread uh, in all of these cultures. So let's go back through time uh, and look at that stemma. As it turns out, uh, the child killing night demon has a very long history and it goes all the way back to 2000 BC to ancient Sumeria. Uh, there are plenty of incantations against this demon that is known as Lamashtu or the Lilu uh, demon. And one finds the Lamashtu depicted already in the seventh century before our era in carved limestone amulets that are from Mesopotamia. So here I show you a Neo-Babylonian example that's uh, in the Met Museum. And the, the demoness or uh, she-demon Lamashtu is uh, once again a, a kind of hybrid animal-human creature with sagging breasts. And here uh, animals are, are actually nursing uh, on her breasts. Uh, scholars of uh, ancient uh, Middle Eastern art believe that these amulets were there to protect women uh, during childbirth from this night hag uh, demon known as Lilu or Lamashtu. Um, it's widely believed that Lamashtu is the precursor to this other figure known as Lilith. And that might be the, the demon and the name with which uh, those who are in this webinar are most familiar. Uh, Lilith was the first wife of Adam uh, before Eve. Um, she refused to lie under him as his equal, and therefore she was banished, uh, after which uh, Eve became Adam's partner. And then she decided that she would uh, wreck uh, uh, revenge upon all of the descendants of humankind. Uh, and um, and therefore she's, she goes around killing uh, women and, and their children. Lilith is particularly strong in Jewish traditions, and one finds her represented on these incantation bowls that come from Jewish colonies like Nippur, for example, um, in the post-Sasanian period. So this particular bowl here is from around the 6th or 8th centuries from Iran. Some survive from an Iraq. There's a very strong collection of these uh, incantation bowls in the University of Pennsylvania Museum, but the one I show you here is in the British Museum. What you see represented in this bowl is a Lilith in the center and a very long incantation in um, Mandaic, which is a form of, of Aramaic. Uh, the inscription is pretty clear, and here I've transcribed a little bit uh, from that long inscription, the part that I think is most interesting because this incantation and the bowl itself 
is supposed to bind and neutralize uh, this um, this night demon. Um, and here, let me read the part that I think is interesting from the bowl. Quote, bound and sealed are you, all you demons and devils and Lilis, um, by that hard, mighty, and powerful and strong binding, evil Lilith that leads astray the hearts of humankind and appears in a dream by night and appears in a vision by day, burning, casting down by Nala as she falls, slaying boys and girls and sucklings, male and female, be subdued and sealed away from the house and from the threshold of Bahram Gushnasp, son of Ashtad Anahid. Amen, amen, salah. So prayer uh, at the end. Um, so the inscription makes it clear that this bowl is to bind and seal and therefore neutralize all of the Lilis, these night demons that, that harm women and children. And that's not all. There are a couple other inscriptions in this bowl that suggest that you can bind these demons by other ways, including with metal objects. Um, and so the inscription goes on to say that you can put a peg in her nose, pincers of iron in her mouth, an iron chain around her neck, iron fetters on her hands, and stone rocks on her feet. So uh, in essence, this object is there to protect the home. It can be buried at the corner of a house or the door, which is a, a, a very vulnerable opening to the house. Um, and this sort of scraggly haired demon, often shown with pointed breasts uh, and sometimes with genitalia that's uh, overemphasized, will therefore be neutralized. So uh, Lilith has been studied substantially, uh, especially in Jewish traditions. And one of the, the most important studies on Lilith is by, uh, by Raphael Patai. And Patai says that a Lilith is an interesting character across traditions because um, she is, quote, uh, the ghostly paramour of men, and she constituted a special danger for women during many periods of their sexual life cycle, before defloration, during menstruation, and so forth. A mother in the hour of childbirth and her newborn babe were especially vulnerable and therefore had to be protected from the Lilis. They also managed to prevent the birth of children by causing barrenness, miscarriages, and complications during childbirth. So here we have a demonic explanation for all the things that can go wrong in a moment of physical vulnerability for a preparant woman, a woman who is pregnant, having a child, has a newborn child, and that fetus or child, whether it's pre-birth or right after birth. And so the question then uh, becomes, you know, how are these things used over time? And it becomes clear when you look at the visual and material evidence that many of these items actually functioned as amulets uh, that were pendant. Um, and so uh, some of the modern materials uh, shed a lot of light on what came before. And so here I show you a 19th century, so a modern example of a Lilith amulet. And there, uh, there's a, an interesting corpus of these in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. And they tend to be made out of silver, engraved. Lilith is shown as a strange little demonic figure. And then there are other prayers and incantations against her uh, in Hebrew that are also engraved within the amulet. And once again, they're meant to be hanging. A number of scholars have shown that these were either hanging around the necks of newborns or they were pendant on, on their cradles. Now, these are so common that they have a very specific name uh, in the, the German-speaking Jewish communities, and they're known as childbed amulets, so kind bet settel here. So we're looking at a whole corpus of childbed amulets uh, of a she-demon who kills uh, children in particular. And as I mentioned, she was Adam's first wife, and she's mentioned in Isaiah, so it's important in terms of the, the Jewish uh, stratum of the story to establish her as a screech owl or night hag, which is the terminology that's used in, in Isaiah. Now, of course, 
I'm now interested in the Islamic part of the equation as an Islamicist. And I asked myself, what is the she demon who kills uh, pregnant women and children in Islam? And it turns out there's a very strong tradition uh, of that demoness also in Islamic traditions, no doubt carried through from ancient the ancient Middle East through the Talmudic period onward in Byzantine lands through the through Gelo or Hul and then leading to what is the equivalent in Islamic lands. So we find this demon as both a talisman and a figure uh, in Islamic traditions. And what I'll start off here is with a, a very interesting collection of prophylactic amulets. So amulets that are there to protect you. Um, this is quite late, this manuscript, also 18th or 19th century. And it's held uh, in uh, the Université de Saint-Joseph in Beirut. Here you'll notice that we've got a sword. This is the sword of Ali, which is protective. Other items that protect you from scorpion bites and snake bites. So we have snakes and scorpions. And then in the middle of these talismans is this figure right here that I'll zoom in on. That looks like a quadruped or a lion. Um, so reminiscent of, of Gelo, and uh, it, this quadruped is identified as Tabi'a Um Asibyan in Arabic. Tabi'a, right here, is a female jinn or demon, um, and the word Tabi'a is follower. And it's believed that every human has a, a jinn or a demon follower or companion or karin. And if it's a female, it's a karina. So when we're born as humans, we have a male or female jinn or demon follower or companion. So this figure is identified as tabia or tabia, excuse me, a demon follower. And her name is given as um sibyan which literally means mother of children. Um, and that is her most common appellation in Islamic land. So Gelo becomes Umma Sibyan, the mother of children. And sometimes she's referred to as Umma Layl, or the mother of, a, of the night. So all of these terms make it clear that this is a female demonic companion of humans that flutters around at night and gets involved with women and children. And she attacks women, especially during menstruation or haid in Arabic, and above all during birth or wilada uh, in Arabic. Now you'll notice that uh, besides this quadruped depiction, amuletic form of Umm Sibyan, we also have these very interesting uh, illegible signs below her. And uh, based on uh, studies of the Seal of Solomon, this is most likely the seven signs that re represent the ineffable name of God. These have been studied and published by Dawkins in a really great article on the Mush Suleiman, the Seal of Solomon, and they recall God's name in an ineffable way and function as, ta function as talis talismanic signs that will counter this killer of women and children. And so in Islamic lands, Um Sibyan is also very much tied to Solomon, just as she is um, in Byzantine Christian traditions. And it's believed that she, in fact, entered into a, a contract, um, an understanding with Solomon that she wouldn't kill uh, women and children if she's confronted with his signs. And so there's a conflation between Solomonic talismans and talismans of Um Sibyan um, in the Islamic tradition. Now, she's a tabia and she's a, a tabia and a karina. So that's a kind of demon. But there's another term that's also used in Islamic lands, which is more Persianate uh, for this special class of demons. And that's al, sometimes al or alk. Um, and we see the all as a special class of demons across all of Asia. We find them in our Armenian, Persian, Kurdish, Yazidi, and other Central Asian and Transcaucus uh, cultures. And here I show you just one example of an uh, Armenian depiction of the equivalent of Um Sibyan, the demon here that's stealing the, the innards of a, of a woman. So there are talismans also for from Armenian Christian cultures 
uh, against the Al or Alk. Um, she is just like in other traditions, an incessant threat to pregnant women and their newborns. And she's often described as part a hul or a gaul, a demon, and a shape shifting a succuba. So she sucks the innards and, and blood uh, of, of humans. Often she's described as having disheveled hair, iron teeth, sagging breasts, and firing tongue, fiery tongues. And what's fascinating to me, and this is a whole other branch of research I can't go into, but um, I've I've been collecting this precisely because of that metal in the Kelsey, is that in 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 Turkey still today you will hear the term al, but al basması, al basta, al karısı, which is being pressed or under the influence of the al of this she demon, and it also means puerperal fever and postpartum infection in medical terminology today. Um, and many ethnographers went out to Turkey to rural areas in the 1930s and recorded all of these traditions uh, in, in rural Turkey about al basmasa and all of the amulets to stop uh, this all this demon from, from wrecking havoc uh, among women who are pregnant and having children. So it, it was very much alive in the 20th century and it survives in medical terminology today to be under the the yoke of all means to have um, an infection after giving birth and to develop a really serious uh, a fever. As this uh, creature, this demon, Tabea, is also depicted in a number of other sources as a figure in Islamic lands. Um, one of the more interesting depictions that I found is in a book of talismanic uh, devices that is entitled the Kitab al-Burhan, or the Book of Surprises, uh, that is now in the Bodleian Library at Oxford. It's very early, so 14th century, made in Iran or Iraq, and it includes one of the most extensive cycles of figural depictions of demons uh, in Islam. And as you flip through the folios, you'll land on this one. And it's very clearly tabea because it says, the figures caption, you know, what is said about this demon, a tabea. Um, and so a tabea here is depicted as a fiery tongue, a demoness with really sagging breasts and disheveled hair as she grabs an infant in her lap. Um, we're often told that when she kills a child, a real human child, she grabs that child and uh, uh, and strangles it and suckles it, but uh, the, the milk is toxic and the child just dies uh, along the way. And here you see that, that process of the demon stealing the child on the verge of death as other demons flutter in uh, as her demonic cohort. So... Um, this is not just a depiction of Tabea. This actually functions as a figural talisman to counter her, mal uh, her maleficent forces to neutralize her. And uh, we know this is the case because a fascinating um, book of magic and talismans still survives from the 20th century in the Princeton University Library. This has never been studied uh, thoroughly. Um, but this has really captured my attention as a result of uh, the Kelsey show. Um, at the very back of this manuscript of folk medicine is a photograph of the folk doctor himself. So this was probably the doctor who created this book of magic and talismans um, for the purposes of, of uh, going from house to house and, and engaging in folk medicine. And a large section of this book of magic actually shows demons literally sucking the life out of a mother and her newborn. So here you can see this kind of string um, being pulled, and that's kind of the life being taken out of both mother and child and or snatching away the child um, and killing it. So this is a symbolic way of explaining uh, death. But also this folk doc doctor had a whole range of potions uh, that he used to, to counter this demon. And there are wonderful studies of, of, of the use of uh, harmel and fumigations, garlic and other plants 
that was used in the process of folk medicine at birth to, to counter these uh, these malignant forces that took on, took on a symbolic demonic shape. Um, besides these figural depictions, there are a number of talismans that were also printed over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries, especially in Iraq and in Ottoman lands. And you can still find them up on walls in Turkey today. And in fact, I have one myself that I purchased. Uh, they're printed like this, and you can put it up on your wall flat, but you can also cut them out like uh, vertically and then line them up and create a scroll and then carry it as an amuletic scroll. Um, that's why the format is this series of verticals. So eventually it becomes an amuletic scroll. Uh, I hadn't looked at, at this part of the amulets closely until this uh, exhibition, but it turns out that many of these very popular printed amulets have in, one area that's called uh, the Seven Solomonic Contracts. So, and this is the contract between Solomon and Uma Sibien that she wouldn't harm humankind. And it's also known as the prayer of Uma Sibien. And if you go into the text, um, it's also a really interesting um, prayer because it explains a lot um, for us. So let me head straight into the text itself. Uh, it, and it's in Arabic. It reads, O prophet of God, I am the Um Sibian. I have power over the children of Adam before they are born and over the daughters of Eve before they give birth. I can assume the shape of a dog or a snake and enter their houses. I tie the wombs of the wives so that they cannot conceive. And if they do, they cannot give birth for the fruit will be lying athwart above the exit. And if it does come out, it will be a stillbirth. And if the baby lives, I only have to look at it and it will die for such is the power of my eye. And if I look at the husband, his sap will dry up in his loins and he will shrivel and become powerless. In sum, I am the cause of all suffering and failure of sickness and sadness. Now, when I read this prayer of Um Sibian, um, there were a couple parts that that really made me stop. Um, and those are the parts I've highlighted in yellow, because these are all key terms for me that encapsulate the problem. Um, I tie the wombs of the wives. This is infertility. Maybe it's an ectopic pregnancy where the, the embryo is implanted in a fallopian tube that's been tied up, uh, or the fruit will be lying athwart uh, above the exit. This is uh, perhaps an obstructed birth ca canal or the placenta blocking uh, the birth uh, of, the, of the fetus, or it will be a stillbirth. In other words, the baby will be born dead. Or Uma Sibian only has to look at the fetus once it's born and it suddenly dies. So this is, for me, sudden infant death. And then uh, Uma Sibian also uh, dries up the sap of the male, which explains male impotence. And so it explains all of these problems around human infertility um, and maternal death and infant death but without recourse to this medical terminology. So the demon, uh, in fact, creates a whole host of explained reasons for things going wrong and being violent and, and terribly painful at this critical moment. And so the more I looked at Gelo, this one amulet uh, from Byzantine lands, the more I went back and then I went forward, I realized I was looking at a, at a whole chain of symbolic thought from uh, ancient Sumeria with Lamashtu and Lilu, going through Jewish traditions with Lilith, onward to Byzantine Christian traditions with Gelo, all of these Asian traditions of the Al, the she demon, and finally Um Sibian in Islamic traditions as the mother of, of children, a whole class of she demons that accompany the childbed um, that, in fact, has been studied as a phenomenon in German 
uh, scholarship as Kindbent uh, Dämoninen. You know, of course, in German, you can create one one word with many, many words. So uh, child bed uh, demonesses. Um, and that's a phenomenon that actually crosses all these cultures and crosses time to explain uh, all of these phenomena. And so uh, in going through this material, I realized that we have to make way uh, in our gallery spaces when we look at the crossroads of cultures to really think about the vulnerability of preferent women and newborns, because this is a common theme and how can we perhaps get that across um, in uh, the pre-medicalized terminology of our world. This was considered the demonic cause of miscarriages and the death of mother and fetus. And then finally, it explains uh, a host of, of purely physical problems, uh, including antepartum and postpartum hemorrhaging, right? This, this demon actually sucks the blood, so it explains uh, ble uh, bleeding to death. It explains placenta previa, which was extremely common uh, before the 20th century with the placenta obstructing the birth canal and a host of other uh, complications, including uh, infection and, and fever, which is still known in Turkish as being under the yoke of the she demon. And so as I zoom out and really conclude, I simply wanted to say that for me, it's it's been a, a great research rabbit hole just to have to understand this Byzantine uh, amulet. And it took me all the way down and then all the way up again across cultures. And it forced me to think about how we can make more room in the permanent installation of crossroads of culture to really get across um, some of these big issues that, that face not just men, but women and children. And hopefully we can make uh, carve out a space for some of this material through objects and then bring in some of these comparative works uh, to carve out a place uh, for some of the aspects of uh, the ancient world that uh, aren't highlighted as much, uh, but perhaps should be. So with that, uh, I thank you very much and I would uh, welcome your, your questions, um, suggestions, because this is obviously work in progress. So thank you, Stephanie. Thank you so much, um, Christiane Gruber. We really appreciate, um, this was an incredible webinar and I want to now open it up to our audience. Um, so if you want to put your questions in the question and answer, um, I will read those out. Um, so feel free to do that now. I've stopped sharing as well. <laughs> so I can see the, the chat as well. Are these collections you sewed viewable at the Kelsey from uh, Clara or Clara? Um, the medallion that I showed, that uh, big amulet of either Solomon or St. Sicinius killing uh, this she-demon is up on display right now in the gallery. So you can see that, that amulet. Uh, the other materials that I showed you are uh, comparative materials from largely other collections. Um, so some of them are available online, some are not. If you're interested in a particular object, I can I can always send you that information. But I really encourage you to go see the the spotlight and you'll be surprised by how big this amulet is. Great, and this spotlight will be up until early May, I believe. So um, definitely come visit if you can. So I had a question. Um, so Professor Gruber, do you envision this 
theme being present potentially in the final iteration of, of this gallery here at the Kelsey? So th that will have to depend on how we can maybe move uh, objects around um, and conservation issues. But you guys have a, a, a great demon bowl in the ancient Middle East um, section on the first floor when you enter from the, the main entrance, public entrance off of Maynard. Um, I think it would be really interesting to do a small between, either it can be on a uh, rotating between three, four months, or maybe it can last longer. But I would love to see that medallion next to um, the so-called demon bowl, so an incantation bowl, because we do have them in the Kelsey. Um, potentially uh, a depiction of a demon from the Hatcher, so in a manuscript, an Islamic manuscript. Um, and then I would want to have digital reproductions of uh, some of the other materials that I've shown you. Um, a one interesting idea would be to have that Princeton manuscript, which is fully digitized uh, on a screen that you could actually foliate and have those demons actually identified. That hasn't been done yet. The demons haven't been identified. Um, but I was thinking this could be a really interesting project uh, uh, for either me, for myself and, and a student interested in working on Persian language materials with me, folk medicine. Um, so the script is really uh, very hasty and hard to decipher. So it, it will take uh, quite a bit of work, but I think it, it would be it would be a nice mooring point. Um, it, I, I think I think this would be a major subject, uh, and it's hard to wiggle our way around around. I would say illness and death, because that would be just a common a common challenge that all of these individuals faced and had to respond to, visually and artfully, over time. And the the coping strategies are remarkably stable. Uh, across 4,000 years here, which is not necessarily the case with other traditions. Yeah, so we'll see. This might turn into a, a subject that will be permanent or maybe rotational through different strategies. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I see a couple questions, too, in Q&A. Absolutely. So let's see. Um, Ann Cassidy says, that was amazing. Could you say anything more about St. Cecinius and these their differences from Solomon's role? Uh, yeah, great question. And so uh, we know quite a bit about Lilith with Solomon um, from the Jewish sources and also the Islamic sources, Solomon and Karina. There are actually two books on that alone. That's how uh, thoroughly detailed the Solomon and she demon story is within the Jewish um, and uh, Islamic tradition. St. Cecinius is lesser known um, and is very much tied to the area of Antioch. Uh, and it seems that the St. Cecinius killing the, the she demon is more of a so, sort of sixth century Eastern Mediterranean phenomenon. And it's echoed also in, in Coptic traditions. And in fact, there are some frescoes um, of a similar kind of she demon slayer from uh, Bawit in, in Egypt. So here you're looking at a, a regional variant of the Solomonic story of the she demon, and you've got a couple of them in late antiquity from Egypt to the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, but the similarities are, are uh, striking. Um, but St. Cecinius doesn't have a very long conversation with Lilith in pre-time, um, just like Solomon does. So it's slightly, slightly different, but there are all these variants um, and you see, you see them in the amulets. So um, Stephanie, did you want to read the other questions? I Absolutely. Um, so Patricia asks, is there a term for when a dangerous creature's attributes are transformed into something aprotopraic? For example, terawatt is part hippo and part crocodile. Oh, yeah, that's that's something I've been thinking about quite a bit um, because the aspects of these uh, dangerous creatures are uh, the most dangerous aspects, right? The emphasized breast, the demonic uh, fiery tongue, the disheveled hair. When they're turned into a talisman, they're also the most apotropaic features. So it's almost like the Medusa effect where you you can take uh, the most hyperbolic elements of the creature and ricochet 
uh, the power of those elements uh, upon the the malevolent um, creatures. So you you see that quite a bit, uh, as you mentioned in in ancient Egypt. You see it also in in Islamic amulets uh, as well. So there are all these demons uh, where the figure itself is the protection or the representation of the demon is the protection against the demon in a refractor, uh, refractory or mirrored uh, way. So, um, so those features are both uh, the most dangerous, but they're also the most protective. Um, and so it has that, that uh, Janus like uh, effect. I hope that answered the question. Great. Um, so with this next question, um, Christiane, I'm going to ask your help in pronunciation of some of the terms here. Mm. Um, so, uh, so yeah, Christiane, thank you for such an interesting cross-cultural interpretation. I just wanted to note, um, and I wasn't sure how to say, um, Hariti, yeah. Hariti, okay. Um, circa 1st century BCE onward, a demoness, um, Yakshini, who devoured children but was later turned to a Buddhist protector of children. Might there be a connection of such a demoness to South Asia? That is a great question, Suyog. And for those of you who don't know Suyog, he, he's uh, uh, our PhD student in art history who's working with me on the uh, permanent gallery and a specialist of South Asian art. So Suyog, you know, I'm not very familiar with, with this uh, demoness, um, Hariti. And here it seems like she started off devouring uh, children, kind of like chaos, you know, the, the figure of chaos, but then turns out to be a protector of children. And here the role has been completely flipped from destroyer to protector. That I haven't seen in this stemma uh, of the she demoness. She's always destroying children and never protects them. So it, it seems to me that this is slightly different on the she demoness uh, spectrum, but I would love to sit down and speak to you and find out more about Hariti here because there is a common thread here in terms of uh, devouring children. So I'm not surprised either uh, because this is pan-Asian, uh, pan-Mediterranean, um, that you would have this demonic force that explains why, why children are literally guzzled up um, by death at such a, uh, a high rate um, you know, across time. Anyway, I can't wait to pick up the thread, Suyog, on that. Thanks. Great. Um, and then it looks like potentially a follow up from Anne's question. Um, is there the same anxiety about female and male babies? Great question. And the simple and quick answer is there's more anxiety about the male babies. And I could go on and on and on, but I think I think you'll know why that is. So much more anxiety about the male babies uh, dying, but also anxiety that it will get all the babies, including the female ones. Great. Thank you. So it looks like that's the majority of our questions here. Um, so I don't, it looks like we are almost ready to wrap up. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, and especially thank um, Professor Christiane Gruber for this absolutely phenomenal webinar. Um, thank you for being with us over your lunch hour. Thank you. Thank you for welcoming me and in, indulging uh, uh, not fully baked uh, research as I wrap my head around this material. And thank you for your questions and for your feedback. That was going to really help me understand you know, what what I think we might be able to do with this topic uh, within the galleries sailing forward. So I really appreciate it.